Hi, it's very good to be here. Um, so whenever I present, people say United Nations and virtual reality, that seems like a contradiction in terms and very unlikely that you know a bureaucratic organization is working in virtual reality, but we are. And uh, you can download the app and it's excellent. Um, we, you know, were very fortunate because we were able to very early on experiment with VR. Um, I'm also a VR creator and I directed Clouds Over Sidra, which is about a 12-year-old girl named Sidra in Zatri refugee camp. And this was, you know, this debuted in early January 2015 and was one of the first type of experiences that we're able to you know, really test this hypothesis of whether we could use this for social impact, whether we could use this to change people's minds and do something about the crisis. Um, so this talk is a little bit about that, but it's a little bit more philosophical uh, and it'll be in three parts, because I know you guys like structure here in Sweden, so. Um, so, <laughs> and jokes, that's Switzerland, I just found out. Um, <laughs> So, you know, starting out, when we, you know, when I was given the opportunity to go out there with a rig, I thought, you know, this has been done before when someone probably got a video camera for the first time or uh, a camera to make photographs. And I think the, each new birth of a new medium, really people come to grips with how you really use this to show people's pain and how we can use this to make you understand what other people are going through that you're not going through. So this is one of the first photographs from the American Civil War and one of the first photographs around. And it's actually of, um, I'm actually gonna use this laser. This is amazing. Uh, this here is you know, more of a battleground. And these are actually civilians and politicians who are trying to understand what's happening inside and it just goes to show you that, you know, with photography, it's already there's this need to want to see what you couldn't see before. And of course, this starts from, you know, cave times when we always wanted to show what is it that's happening when you haven't been there. But before photography, you know, you really had painting. And this is from the Napoleonic era. And all depictions of war before photography are not horrific, are not difficult. They're very heroic, and people had a very different relationship to what war, violence, poverty, suffering would be. But now this is changing, right? Um, this is from Facebook Live. Uh, this is Diamond Reynolds, and it's a still from her live stream cell phone footage of when Philando Castillo was shot and this is the first time it was very scary because you had a live feed of someone being killed and you could watch it, right? And I think the intuition, the sort of thing is with these new technologies, whether it's virtual reality or whether when it was cinema, when it was um, photography, if you just show people's pain, if you just show how horrible it is, it'll get better. But if there's one sort of thesis that we try to kind of impart with UNVR is that's not true. And this is why we will go through it. So if we think about a little bit of what we're doing, um, it's really, you know, representing the pain of others. And some of, I think some of the best sort of thinker on this was Susan Sontag, who wrote regarding the pain of others. And she really examines, and a lot of the talk is, you know, if you want to go deeper into some of what's going on, a lot of it is some of her ideas of why it's just not enough to show suffering. Why? We grow numb, right? We live in an age and a time that we are inundated by horrible pictures, yet it doesn't necessarily move you to do something. And similarly with UNICEF, we started with you know, these horrific pictures and, you know, Audrey Hepburn went out there and we realized that this was an initial approach of how we thought you would get to care. But you watch this now and you're almost, you cringe or you feel 
very uncomfortable. But back then, that was the intuitive thing because we have these sort of new technologies and we can bring you out and we have access. But we've evolved. This is from um, our uh, pictures from Syria and you'll realize it's a lot happier, there's more hope, there's more context, uh, there's a little bit of captions of what happens. If you actually go to our website, we actually give the children names that wasn't done uh, previously. Uh, these, a lot of this was not given context. So that is to show you that there is a different way and a better way so you just don't feel numb to suffering. You could actually see ordinary life, you could see people you know, working in that way. So besides growing numb, um, why else doesn't just showing pain and just showing horrible things work? Well, whether you know it or not, or you probably do, is we have a lustful relationship to violence. It's kind of like when you are driving down the highway and there's an accident. Everybody slows down to watch it, but no one's going to stop and help. You just, you want to know what's going on. And, you know, we have a lot of sort of visual media with clockwork orange, um, um, and Jesus Christ uh, suffering. I, I, I know I can do this in Sweden because, you know, God is dead here, according to Ingmar Bergman, so it should be fine. Um, what is another reason that this can't work? It can be exploited by the enemy. The same horrible picture you see of a black person being killed or a poor uh, Palestinian being killed or starving uh, can mean very different things to different people. What is one person's horror is another person's revenge, right? So, you know, you have this, where you have this war, and you have people watching, you know, into Gaza, and in a lot of ways, it, is, uh, it has a different connotation. They do want to see suffering, but for very different reasons. Um, now, this is a, a photo that we all know that has motivated and inspired people to, you know, do something. It's, but it's Ailan, he's a three-year-old who died. But the same picture was used by ISIS as propaganda for people inside of their territories to say, this will happen to you if you leave. And so, you know, this is why the approach when we came with VR is very, is very different uh, of how we would do it. So, um, you know, so I just want to make sure something here. Sorry. Is this the longer version or is this the shorter? This is the same version? Okay, okay. So just a little bit about, um, you know, why some of our approach is different. Uh, we think sensational, shocking pictures kill storytelling. Um, and, you know, some of the best sort of examples of this are the show, a documentary, which I, you know, is used as a gold standard in documentary filmmaking, which uses no archival footage and paralyzes the imagination. It says I have 93 slides here, that's the only thing. So that's the only thing. So is it, is it the 15 minute version? If you could, sorry. Yeah, because I'm really sorry about this because this is, yeah, this is the old one. This is not the one that we had. I'm so sorry. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> so let's put it right there, okay. So, sorry about the sort of thing, technical difficulties. Um, another example of how some of this uh, is, is, you know, not, is, is really related to some of this is uh, War Against War was a book that is in between the First World War and Second World War, again, using photography, and basically it's all the horrible pictures of World War I that you could possibly see was in 10 editions in Germany and in a lot of ways was not able to do anything to stop the next war. And it just goes to show you, as I was saying, we need to have a different approach. So a lot of our VR stuff will have, you know, let me just get back through here. This is now a different order, okay. Exploited by the enemy, I'm sorry. So we want to give some examples of some things that can work that are a little bit better. This is another example from you know, World War I where it's not, uh, sorry, from the Depression era, which is it's not just horrible things. It makes you use your imagination of what's happening and you slow, you know, you're, you're able to be a lot more subtle and it's a lot more about you're using your own imagination 
of where things are going. Here's an example from Poland, uh, from Auschwitz. Now, when you look at this, um, when you look at this, you just say, okay, people walking, kids, but the caption in the museum when you watch it is, this is exactly the moment right before they go into the gas chamber. This is the last moment. And you see those kids holding their hands. And maybe you see that mother pursing her lip. And see, it's that storytelling, that context, that really gives you the chills and I think gives you a greater form of empathy. Um, you know, another sort of way that, uh, you know, like I showed you with the Black Lives Matter, is it more impactful that we see him being killed? Or what if we had footage of him spending his last day with his daughter before he's killed? And we saw that and we told you that was the last time she would ever see him. I think it's those types of things that we have to bring in with storytelling, with context, that I think is a lot more impactful than just putting a VR rig and showing horror and showing everything. Another example is um, Silvered Water. It uses uh, YouTube footage from Syria and is able to build context and is able to build more out of it so it's just more than shock and horror. But the empathy machine, a very controversial term in the VR world of, of, uh, of how we use, how we use um, virtual reality. At the UN, we really feel this works. And I think it works because we have our own definitions of what empathy would mean. And so I'm not gonna read this out, but I just want to, to think that when you go and you're trying to use this to try to do something with empathy, it's important to really, it's important to really have your own definition of what you're trying to achieve. So that's where we go at it. Now, enough of the philosophy, why virtual reality at the UN? Because the press loves us, right? They go crazy, you do tech, you do everything. And my favorite is this quote over here from the New Yorker, which is a real quote, by the way, and you can laugh at it later. Um, and you know, it's really given us our mission, which is, yes, we bring these stories, we create empathy, but our real sort of aim is that we believe empathy leads to action. So how does that work? So one of the things that we do Please work, sorry. This is where I'm technologically deficient, even though I work in VR, okay. Uh, one of the ways that we did it is we took a four minute, I made a four minute version of Clouds Over Cedra, and it's probably in Sweden as well, but it's in 40 different countries where we've outfitted it with face-to-face -face fundraisers who you know, give people and take them to a Syrian refugee camp. And we find that this type of approach has doubled donations for UNICEF, which helps bring more sort of aid in a lot of humanitarian camps. So this has been our business case and some of the impact, and it's a big reason why we keep going forward. But as we know, life is more than just money. Uh, our third film, My Mother's Wing, which is on Gaza, uh, is actually used for peace building, and we brought it to the streets of Israel and in Tel Aviv to really give ordinary citizens an idea of what it's like in Gaza, what it's like to kind of have an ordinary life there and to share this story of a mother who lost two of her children in the war. So that's you know, a little bit more about how we are using it for impact. Uh, now I have a minute and 30 seconds. So, uh, uh, and the next part is Dionysios. Okay, I know you're probably wondering what that has to do with anything. Well, it's a little bit how Jessica said that, you know, there is a vocabulary in how we talk about things. And with wine, you know, if you really realize, you know, if you get into it, and I'm originally from Queens in New York, so I discovered wine very late in college. Um, and sushi and all those nice things. And I realized that if you have a particular um, vocabulary about it, your relationship to what you're experiencing changes. And in a lot of ways, you know, I think if we, you know, whether it was, you know, not viewer and visitor, uh, I think we need to really understand that when we build these new experiences, we'll build these new words, we experience new experiences within what's happening. So I think presence is something that is really something that is always alluded to and always something that is this mysterious quality that we experience in virtual reality. And presence can be made in many ways. In regular cinema, uh, and this is where I, you know, I had to do it. Uh, in regular cinema, it really happens 
It probably happened, uh, there's other instances, but this is of course Summer with Monica, um, and I'll be looking for Monica later, uh, where she looks at the camera for the first time. And this sort of scene just absolutely blew everybody away in the new wave and everything, that you could actually do that, you could feel like you're there with her. And in VR, it isn't always that someone looks at you. It's a lot of it is through sound. A lot of it is through other ways that we're discovering. A lot of it is camera height. A lot of it is things that we haven't figured out yet. And so, you know, this is, you know, a still from Sidra. And there's different sort of things here that we use. Um, and I encourage you to download the app, UNVR, on your iOS or your, your Android. And you can watch this and you can see what are certain things that make you feel more present. Sometimes you're a ghost, sometimes you're not. You know, and there's different sort of relationships that we do here. So with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for, for having us.